Good afternoon. Buenas tardes. In Contepec, the village where I was born, I was 10 years old when I came home from playing soccer and saw a shotgun that a friend had lent my brother to go dog hunting propped against the wall. I took the gun under my arm and went to the backyard where my parents were building a new kitchen. Shotgun in hand, I clambered up a pile of bricks and scanned the sky. I pointed the gun at a flock of birds silhouetted against the blue, but when I pulled the trigger, I am away. These free flying birds remind me of the cage birds my mother kept. These free flying birds well, whose, were uh, singing, whose singing woke me every morning. And I couldn't bring myself to kill them. I let the gun drop and the bot hit the bricks. A volley of shot pierced my belly and hand, and my body was on fire. My parents came running when, I, when they heard the news. My bo they, they bundled me into Contepec's only taxi, and we drove to the nearest town. They bond Luckily for me, the local doctor was out, probably on a drinking spree. Eight hours passed before we reached the city of Toluca. At the, at the first hospital, my father found the doctor who was on call told him to take me home as I was going to die. And there would be a lot of red tape getting my corpse out of Toluca. <laughs> my father pleaded him to operate. I opened my eyes the next afternoon in a hospital room. My parents were staring down at me as if I had returned from the dead. During my recovery, I read King Grizzly Bird by the Brothers Grimm and Sandokan, a pirate swashbuckler by Emilio Salgari that my father had bought in Toluca's only bookstore. Nineteen days later, it was changed, a uh, changed Homero, someone who had seen the face of death, who returned to Contepec. My childhood had been split in two. I spent all day reading and writing and playing chess instead of soccer, since sports were now forbidden to me. Perhaps because my father was Greek, my brother gave me the Iliad and the Odyssey. Years later, while walking with my wife and daughters on Altamirano Hill, a peasant called out to me, Omerito, I read your book and I like it very much. Which book? I asked. The Iliad, Omerito, the Iliad, they made us read it in school. When are you going to write another book? I am already writing it. What is the title? The Odyssey. Contepec was a long way from, my, from a, any ocean or jungle, and nearly 10,000 feet above sea level. I had never seen whales or dolphins or tigers or lions or scarlet macaws or sea turtles, but these animals soon filled my imagination and became part of my childhood mythology. My first lion was a colored illustration in a boring story. My elephant was a clay figurine I had won at a ring toss game at the fair held every October in honor of St. James. But one day, a sad old elephant, the star attraction of, travel, of a traveling circus, came to Contepec. 
I did not know then that the fabulous elephant was being slaughtered in Africa for its tusk. I had no idea that wild animals were being killed from their skins, for their skins, flesh, organs, and eggs, or for the mere sport of taking their lives. But I had already learned the lesson that on this earth, in the sphere of the living, there is no greater, greater luxury than life itself, for humans and for animals and for plants, and for the birds that I had thought of killing on the day when I almost killed myself. My accident led me to books and to writing. My near-death experience permeates my life and sensibility as a writer. And the birds sparked a passionate concern for the environment. I understood that somehow my own survival was connected to theirs. Like so many other Mexicans, I left my hometown for the big city to study and to write poetry. But my dreams always took place in Contepec, my natural sanctuary. While I was Mexico's ambassador to the Netherlands in the 1970s, the seeds of conflict between my personal conviction, convictions and my official duties were sown when I sent the president of Mexico letters we had received protesting the slaughter of sea turtles in Oaxaca. He replied angrily, asking me why I bothered him about turtles when there was important work to do, such as selling Mexico's oil, uranium, and natural gas. A few years later, I moved back to Mexico. One smoggy day in February 1985, a philosopher friend wrote to a newspaper complaining about the pollution. I knew no one would pay attention to one small voice, but I thought that if many of us denou denounced Mexico City's deadly air pollution, we stood a chance of being heard. I wrote the text, friends made phone calls, and on March 1st, a declaration signed by 100 writers and artists came out in the Mexican and foreign press, stating that this pollution, pollution was, called, was killing us all. The, the, the group of 100 was born. Coming from Mexico, where writers are public figures whose opinions are respected, and where they are expected to play an active part in the country's affairs, championing human rights and the environment, advocating social justice, and fighting corruption, whether through literature or through their actions, I took both roads. In the winter of 1987, as the city suffocated under a blanket of smoke in a park downtown, I gathered death bears that had fallen victim to the poison air we were all breathing. We compelled the government to publish daily reports of air pollution levels and to remove lead from gasoline. Thanks to us, a program was started called Oil No Circula, Don't Drive Today. We stopped the filling in of a migratory bear sanctuary in Lake Texcoco to enlarge the international airport. And when we found out that a government company had imported thousands of ton tons of powder milk contaminated by fallout from, uh, from the nuclear plant accident in Chernobyl, we prevented its distribution in Mexico. Early in 1990, I published five newspaper articles about the slaughter of sea turtles in Mexico. These articles became the basis for an international campaign to hold the killing. In May 1990, the president announced a ban on, on the capture of sea turtles 
that, that swim in Mexican waters and nest on Mexican beaches and on trade in, the, in sea turtle products. My book, Searching for Archelon, an Odyssey of Seven Sea Turtles, featuring a female leatherback turtle who leads six of the, her fellows on a journey through today's oceans in search of Archelon, ancestors of all sea turtles, has been called a lord of the rings of the seas. Contepec, <coughs> Contepec nestles against Altamirano Hill which is home every winter to millions of monarch butterflies. Well before the Group of 100 was founded, and before 1975, when scientists discovered that the butterflies flew from Ontario to the Oyamel Forest in the states of Michoacan and Mexico, I had written about the monarchs who were part of the landscape of my childhood. After I moved away, I would return every year to climb the mountain. And during these visits, I learned about logging and fires on Altamirano Hill and at the other monarch sites. In, in 1986, I convinced the president of Mexico to protect the monarch butterfly forest, including Altamirano Hill. In 2008, as Mexico's ambassador to UNESCO, I was able to get the Monarch Butterfly Biosphere Reserve listed as a World Heritage Site. Now the Monarch survival depends to a certain extent on the drug traffickers who operate in the state of Michoacan. My novel Butterfly Mountain was inspired by the Monarch. In March 2000, five years after I denounced a plan by Mitsubishi and the Mexican government to build the world's largest solar soil works in Baja California on the shores of San Ignacio Lagoon, a pristine breeding and calving haven for the great whales that migrate down the Pacific coast from Alaska the president of Mexico canceled the project in the face of widespread international opposition spearheaded by the Group of 100. As leader of the Group of 100, I have often felt like Sisyphus or Cassandra or Don Quixote. Since 1985, my articles in Mexican newspaper have given me a platform to voice my opinions but my visibility has been a light nighting rot as well as a chilled. Over the years, I, I made many enemies and I received death threats for defending dolphins from tuna fishermen, denouncing loggers and stopping dams from being, being built on the Usumacinta River that would have men flooding 500 square miles of the Lacandon Rain Forest or and Mayan ruins and displacing indigenous communities. In 1997, the threats made to me and my family were serious enough for me to accept full-time bodyguards who shadow us everywhere for a year. I will never know whether the government supplied the guards to protect me or to spy on me. Perhaps because I learned about the fragility of life and at an early age, the possibility of an environmental apocalypse has always haunted me. My first millenarian fantasy was the play, a spectacle of the year 2000, when a divine light appears in Mexico City's Chapultepec Park during the last instant of the year 1999. Next, I wrote The Last Adam, a reversal of Genesis, in which all creation is destroyed in six days, and the last man and woman join in a final coupling on Earth. Soon before his death, the Spanish filmmaker Luis Buñuel wrote to me that he was sorry he was too too old 
to make a movie from my book saying that the apocalypse will be the work of man and not of God. For me, it's an absolute cert certainty. The final installment of my apocalyptic tri trilogy is the play The Grand Theater at the End of the World, an imagining of the world in six acts, six acts when the world no longer exists. Constant immersion in the grim reality of Mexico City inspired me to write The Legend of the Sons, La Leyenda de los Soles, a mythological environmental thriller and mosaic, mosaic of daily life in Mexico City in the year 2027. According to Aztec legend, the era of the fifth son, which is the present era, will end with earthquakes. And the Sitsimimi, or monsters, monsters of twilight, will devour the remains of humankind and take over the world. The companion piece to the legend of the sun is, who do you think about when you make love? Bor are set in Ciudad Moctezuma, a metaphor for Mexico City, when you live, and when you live in Mexico City, you know that myths can come true. Twice in the 1990s, I invited writers, scientists, and leaders of native peoples from two dozen countries to Mexico to consider the state of the world as we approach the end of the millennium. The first Morelian Declaration, signed by 1,000 writers and scientists, was presented at the Earth, Earth Summit in Rio de Janeiro in 1992. <clears throat> the Earth's experiences is the worst crisis in history. What evolved in nature over millions of years can be destroyed by humans in half a century. The 21st century may become a century of Noah's who will try to save dying ecosystems and species in biological arcs because it will no longer be possible to save everything. The moral dilemma will reside in which species and ecosystems to choose on what on, and on what long knowledge or wisdom we should base our choice. Nature can survive without man, but man cannot survive without nature. The Greek Stoics believed that man had a place in the universe, which for them was a living organism with a soul, a, mat a material deity. The, de the deity was the universal law of nature. How can we make human be beings perceive losses in nature as their own personal losses. The ancient Mexicans believe it that the sun dies and is reborn. Mircea Eliade pointed out that unlike homo religiosus, modern man views himself as the sole subject and agent of history. He will not be completely, completely free until he has killed the last surviving God, as I see it, that last God will doubtless be the planet itself. When I was a child, I thought of trees as permanent. Now I wonder whether they will be there the next time I look. The Mayas believe it that the sky is held up by trees of different colors red in the east, white in the north, black in the west, and yellow in the south. At the very center stands the ceiba, or silk cotton tree. If we cut down this tree, the heavens will collapse on our heads. Thank you. Well, now I don't know if you have any questions or what.
Muchas gracias, Homero. Sí. Very Thank you. Well, it's a very difficult question because the problem is very difficult. Myself, I, I, I was saying that I was born in Contepec, a little village in, in the center of in central Mexico, and there, there was no water. The, uh, the, the peasants have to transport the water from far away to, to their houses every day. It's, it's something called maromas, to, something on the back and uh, booklets on both sides, and or on themselves on, on the back or in burros. Then we, I appreciate very much water because uh, water was a miracle. We had a wonderful water falling from the sky because the storms, the rainy season was wonderful and I love it. But daily life in the village was difficult because of the lack of water. And later when we had uh, current water, cor cor agua corriente, running water. Cold, running water, even was not the whole day or night, was a few hours a day because it was not enough. And still now the crisis of water is back in the country, not only at the border or in the rivers, but also in Mexico City. I wrote a piece about Mexico City, ¿cómo se llama? Mexico Chaos. Mexico Chaos. About that the, when Mexico City was founded on water, on the lagoons, when the, the Aztecs arrived to Mexico City, they took ritual possession of the place with an immersion on the water, in the lakes. But now, I, I wrote that if Mexico City dies a day, one day, will be because of the lack of water. A city founded in water is going to, is going to die of thirst. That is the, the fate I, I foresee for Mexico City, because the consumption was terrible. It's pollution, it's scarcity, and this is a me mega, mega problem. But in many cities in the country, it's the same problem. Pollution of the water and scarcity at the same time. Then uh, at the border is a big problem also because uh, the, 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 you call them Rio Grande, the Mexican side is Rio Bravo, but uh, many maquiladoras have established and many of these rivers are as used as uh, sewage of cities, places, lakes, and that is a big problem because when uh, the Spaniards arrived to Mexico City, to the Valley of Mexico, was Bernal Diaz del Castillo, and he saw, they saw uh, Mexico City of a um, city of uh, wonder because it was like uh, uh, almost a fantastic city, uh, dreamed by these Amadeus, uh, the, the uh, fabulous uh, night, nights in the Middle Ages that right to a fantastic city. But that, uh, the Spaniards began to dry Mexico City, the canal channels. First for military reasons, because the, the Spaniards, uh, use, uh, the, the Aztecs used the uh, canales, the uh, channels, to transport themselves because many, many streets in Mexico water waterways. And the, the Spaniards and strategy began to dry these channels. And then in the 18th century was one of the biggest stupidities in the urban development. There was some an um, engineer called Enrico Martinez who dried up the, the Texcoco 
lake, and they consider this stupidity a great work of engineering. Uh, Alexander von Humboldt, when they, he came to Mexico, he said, oh, I don't know how the, why the Mexican authorities celebrate the, the drying of this lake. It's the most stupid things I have seen in my life. Did you say Alexander? Von Humboldt. Humboldt. He was a German explorer, very important, because he, he came to Mexico and went to Colombia. He traveled a, a, along, as he was like uh, among the geographies, like the Darwin for the Galapagos and all this. But he, his writings about uh, Latin America of the uh, end of 18 and beginning of the 19th century were really um, extremely useful still now, because he, he was a very intelligent man, geographer, but also an um, uh, ecologist of La Letra. He had this concern by, by the environment already. He went to the volcanoes, to everywhere. He was a great traveler. I recommend you his writings, Alexander von Humboldt. Well, that is the case. But for me, when I travel in Mexico City, in, in, in the Mexican cities, in the interior, the north of the south, the, the central cities, I see the same problem. I, they don't understand the, the politicians, they, or the, they don't understand the importance of water. And even a Mexican mayor, called Guactemo Cárdenas, who was an elected mayor, the, the, when I had a talk with him when he was coming into office, I said to him, the, the only thing important you can do for Mexico City is to uh, recollection of uh, rainwater and recycling the water. He didn't understand. And we have the same problem. The Humboldt Current of the Pacific Ocean was named after Alexander Humboldt. Yeah. Any other questions for our distinguished guest? Mi tocayo, my namesake, Arturo. Gracias, tocayo. Voy a hacerle la pregunta en español primero para entendernos mejor y después la hago en inglés para que todos lo entiendan. Muy bien. Las drogas es una guerra, eh, es una guerra global. Um, la lucha en México es sumamente intensa. ¿Qué papel juega eh, el periodismo en esa guerra hoy día? Now I'm going to make it in English so that everybody can understand what I ask. Uh, drugs is a global war and is very fearful in Mexico at this moment. And my question to you is, being a journalist also as well as, uh, as, as a poet, uh, what, is the, uh, what role is journalism playing in Mexico right in the middle of this fierce war? Well, eh, primero le contesto en español y luego en inglés. El, el, eh, los periodistas juegan un papel muy importante porque arriesgan la vida y en general son muy útiles en, en, en el interior del país, en las, ciudades, en las ciudades de la provincia y en los pueblos. El problema es que son asesinados. Eh, tenemos una, eh, casi cada mes hay uno o dos asesinatos de periodistas nunca investigados porque las autoridades están coludidas con los criminales, con los llamados narcos. Entonces son perseguidos por los políticos y por los narcos porque es casi estar luchando contra la misma banda. Y, y, y las víctimas son los periodistas porque son los que denuncian localmente la corrupción. Entonces estamos encontrando víctimas eh, muy a menudo de periodistas y también de defensores del medio ambiente, eh, campesinos, indígenas que defienden su ecosistema, su laguna, su río, se oponen a proyectos de desarrollo, son asesinados también. Y son asesinados también por políticos en el poder y por narcos, ya no sabemos quién asesina a quién. I am saying to him that the journalists are playing in Mexico a very important role, but uh, the problem is that uh, sometimes the, the, the journalists are killed 
after writing an article, investigating about the corruption co case or a killing, and never the, uh, the killings are never investigated, prosecuted. They, they, they are lost in, in, in El Olvido. And also we are suffering another problem that is the killing of environmentalists, especially indigenous, peasants, uh, local people who defend an ecosystem, uh, oppose a project of development, uh, pollution of a river, a lake, uh, in installation of uh, 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 electrical plants, all that they are killed or opposing uh, the building of dams and never they are investigated. We are suffering really an uh, epidemia, epidemia, epidemia of killings of journalists and environmentalists in Mexico and every day is worse. Okay. Sadly, corruption is rampant all over the globe. <clears throat> yes, exactly, <laughs> yes. We have time for another question. Anybody <clears throat> care to ask our distinguished guest? Bienvenido a Denver, muchas gracias. Gracias. A la pregunta que tenía yo es sobre el capitalismo y la gente indígena, porque yo estoy viendo en Michoacán de donde soy, y también en Oaxaca me dejan mucho el capitalismo que está entrando, la gente indígena está peleando con el capitalismo y, y proteger sus tierras. ¿Cómo ve? Well, I have, um, I have a, a, for instance, a sentence, I like to repeat it in Mexico all the time, that in order you finish with extreme poverty, you have to finish first with obscene richness. Yes. O sea, en español lo digo, para acabar con la pobreza extrema, primero hay que acabar con la riqueza obscena. And we see in Mexico extremes of richness and extremes of poverty. I, I you sometimes, I must to say it, I, I would like to vomit when you, I see rich people have this uh, richness, but the billions and billions and billions of dollars, not uh, one million, two million, five hundred, uh, five hundred millions, but one hundred billions or one hundred fifty billions, they, they declare richness. They are the owners of the country. And they are um, the, the politicians work for them. They, they work for, uh, uh, they began as partners of these very rich people, businessmen, and now they serve them for tips. They are working for the, these rich people for not for, uh, for getting a tip from them. Then the whole system, political system, Mexican system is at the service of these people. Then I have said that um, um, there are three mafiosi people in Mexico of three cartels. The cartel of the politicians, the cartel of the businessmen, and the cartel of the organized crime. And you can exchange all the three. You never know as a Mexican who is who. Because it's for this reason, this drug traffickers war goes on. And the, because it has not end. Because the, 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 the origin is only what were corruption. Other gave me the Iliad and the Odyssey. Years later, while walking with my wife and daughters on Altamirano Hill, a peasant called out to me, Omerito, I read your book and I like it very much. Which book? I asked. The Iliad, Omerito, the Iliad, they made us read it in school. When are you going to write another book? I am already writing it. What is the title? The Odyssey. Contepec was a long way from, my, from a, any ocean or jungle, and nearly 10,000 feet above sea level. I had never seen whales or dolphins or tigers or lions or scarlet macaws or sea turtles. But these animals soon filled my imagination and became part of my childhood mythology. 
My first lion was a pea lot of red tape getting my corpse out of Toluca. My father pleaded him to operate. I opened my eyes the next afternoon in a hospital room. My parents were staring down at me as if I had returned from the dead. During my recovery, I read King Grizzly Bird by the Brothers Grimm and Sandokan, a pirate swashbuckler by Emilio Salgari that my father had bought in Toluca's only bookstore. Nineteen days later, it was changed, uh, changed Homero, someone who had seen the face of death, who returned to Contepec. My childhood had been split in two. I spent all day reading and writing and playing chess instead of soccer, since sports were now forbidden to me. Perhaps because my father was Greek, my brother... Good afternoon. Buenas tardes. In Contepec, the village where I was born, I was 10 years old when I came home from playing soccer and saw a shotgun that a friend had lent my brother to go dog hunting propped against the wall. I took the gun under my arm and went to the backyard where my parents were building a new kitchen. Shotgun in hand, I clambered up a pile of bricks and scanned the sky. I pointed the gun at a flock of birds silhouetted against the blue, but when I pulled the trigger, I am away. These free flying birds remind me of the cage bears my mother kept. This free colored illustration in a boring story. My elephant was a clay figurine I had won at a ring toss game at the fair held every October in honor of St. James. But one day a sat old elephant the star attraction of, travel, of a traveling circus came to Contepec. I did not know then that the fabulous elephant was being slaughtered in Africa for its tusk. I had no idea that wild animals were being killed from their skin, for their skins, flesh, organs, and eggs, or for the mere sport of taking their lives but I had already learned the lesson that on this earth, in the sphere of the living, there is no greater, greater luxury than life itself, for humans and for animals and for plants, and for the birds that I had thought of killing on the day. The flying birds, well, whose were uh, singing, whose singing woke me every morning, and I couldn't bring myself to kill them. I let the gun drop, and the bot hit the bricks. A volley of shot pierced my belly and hand, and my body was on fire. My parents came running when, I, when they heard the news. My they, they bonded me into Contepec's only taxi, and we drove to the nearest town. They bond. Luckily for me, the local doctor was out, probably on a drinking spree. Eight hours passed before we reached the city of Toluca. At the, at the first hospital, my father found the doctor who was on call told him to take me home as I was going to die. And there we 